Hi, I'm Bonnie Thorson, and I've been with the San Diego Mycological Society over 20 years. I was very lucky because my introduction to the Young Mushroom Club coincided with a new series of opportunities for me to hunt wild mushrooms in some pretty hot spots. First, I'd started finding colorful and different species in the mountainous national parks of northern Baja, California. And about then, I also began spending time every year in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, a mushroomer's paradise. San Diego Mycological Society has been a fantastic resource for me from the start, fostering education, camaraderie, and volunteerism in the interest of studying fungi. We owe the club's official creation to the vision and backing of Dr. Elio Schechter. For years, he's challenged members to really study the fungi, both macroscopic and microscopic features. I followed his advice with so many mushrooms and was rewarded with some good knowledge, but especially the fun surrounding it all. Elio has continued to inspire us over the years, leading forays or giving presentations in classes. While we've had a long lineup of dedicated presidents and board members in our history, he, maintained, he remains a generous figure sharing his knowledge, skills, and thoughts, promoting all things mushroom. Now it's our great pleasure to announce that San Diego Mycological Society has paired with the University of California to fund their Graduate Microbiology Award for Excellence in Mycology in honor of our club's founder, Dr. Moselio Schechter. In recognition of his long career devoted to academic microbial research, as well as his promotion of mushrooming as a hobby, we commend and thank Elio by inaugurating our annual scholarship award in his name, the Dr. Elio Schechter Graduate Mycological Scholarship. And now a bit about him personally. Dr. Moselio Schechter, Elio, was born in Milan, Italy, and at age 12, he and his parents found refuge as European Jews in Ecuador. When he was 14, an interest in microbiology was inspired after he read Microbe Hunters by Paul de Cruyff. Studies in high school and medical school, plus his work in bacteriology laboratories, led him in 1950 to the University of Kansas and the University of Pennsylvania for graduate degree. He was soon drafted and served in the U.S. Army doing microbial research at Walter Reed, later spending time in Denmark doing postdoctoral work. After his first job at the University of Florida Medical School in 1962, Elio joined Tufts University in Boston for a 33-year career, chairing their Department of Molecular Biology for 23 years. He also served as president of the American Society for Microbiology in 1985 and 6. It was in Boston that Elio began his serious interest in mycology as a hobby and joined the micro excuse me, the Boston Mycological Club, the oldest amateur mushroom club in the United States, where he actively participated and led for years. It is San Diego's great fortune that when he left, when Elio left Boston in 1995, life brought him here before long he helped organize San Diego Mycological Society. He's been a great inspiration and teacher to many over the years. And while he's never left academia, he maintains teaching positions at both San Diego State University and University of California, San Diego. Elio loves writing and besides authoring dozens of scientific papers and classic microbiology books, in 1997, his delightful book, In the Company of Mushrooms, was published by the Harvard University Press. About 20 years ago, Elio and a few like-minded folks joined efforts and started compiling an online collection of mostly European classical artworks depicting mushrooms. A few years ago, North American, excuse me, North American Mycological Association adopted and incorporated the Registry of Mushrooms in Works of Art. In 2006, he helped originate the popular blog, Small Things Considered, published by the American Society for Microbiology with which Elio and co-bloggers continue to share appreciation of Earth's microbes, which of course sometimes features fungi. 
<clears throat> Elio's life is an amazing story, and for more of it, I recommend a look at his Wikipedia page and the external links section, including his personal memoirs, Small Things Considered blog, and other video uh, interviews. Elio stands as a treasure in our club, and we're pleased to recognize his great works through creating this Mycology Award at UC Riverside. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Sydney Glassman. I'm a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Plant Pathology at the University of California, Riverside. And we have about 20 faculty members in our department and we study microbes and their importance in agriculture, pathosystems, the environment, and in humans. And of course, we study fungi. We study fungi in many aspects. We study their genetics, their genomics, their pathology, their interactions with each other, with plants and the environment. And of course, mycorrhizal fungi, which are mutualistic fungi associated with plants. And I'm very happy today to introduce my PhD student, Bobby Paluto Chavez, who is a third year plant pathology graduate student in my lab. She has been studying the bacterial and fungal responses to chaparral wildfires in Southern California. And she is the recipient of the first annual UC Riverside Microbiology Award for Excellence in Mycology. Hi everyone, thank you very much. I wanna thank the San Diego Society for granting me this award. Um, I am very grateful and this allows me to continue and to uh, share my research with general public. So currently what we are working on as Dr. Glassman mentioned, we're working on understanding the effects of wildfire on fungi and bacteria in a chaparral ecosystem. So what we're doing is like, we want to figure out how this fungi and bacteria respond to fires, how they're changing over time, so their succession. And we want to figure out like how, um, how and if they will ever return to their unburned level. So this is very, very well known for plants. We understand how they change over time. We understand how they replace each other, but we don't know this for fungi or bacteria. So this is one thing that we're looking into, and this is at the Holy Fire and the El Dorado Fire, the 2018-2019 fire. Um, and another thing that we're really, really interested about and we're really excited about is being able to not only figure out which type of fungi or species, species and genus are present, but we're really excited about figuring out what they're doing in the ecosystem. So how they're using up the the new carbon sources, how they're utilizing the changes in nitrogen, um, because this is in order to understand how they're able to restore the system. Um, so, so we're able to use a new set of tools called metagenomics. So it's kind of a mouthful, but metagenomics allows us to find all the DNA or all the genes, so the genomes of all the fungi and bacteria. So pretty much everything in the system and then we're able to um, figure out what they're doing. So this allows us to identify their species, so genes, their, sorry, their species and their genus, and it allows us to figure out what they're doing, so their function. Um, and we're hoping that we're able to use this information to understand how we can maintain the system and how we can restore the system, potentially using some of these microbes if we understand how their, their succession in the system. Very excited. This has been a dream of mine for several years, and, and I appreciate uh, partnering with UC Riverside and uh, finally getting this launched. And congratulations, Fabiola. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate, we appreciate it, and UC Riverside, my department, is very excited to partner with you. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody, to the Mushroom Fair. I'm giving a talk to you about mushrooms through the ages. My name is Elio. Schechter. Okay, let's, start, let's get started. First of all, what is a toadstool? Well, this is a toadstool, right? Does it look like a toadstool? Okay, the word toadstool is not a scientific term. It's a, it, it, some people call toadstools poisonous mushrooms. Other, others call any mushroom a toadstool. It doesn't matter. Okay, so how old are they? Well, Here's a picture of a humongous fungus. What you see here is what appears to be a fungus and it's humongous. It's 20 to 30, 35 million years old. A reproduction of what it may have looked like is like this. In the early Devonian period, about 400 million years ago, years ago this was the dominant figure, the dominant living thing on earth. 
it looked like uh, rockets, I guess. Anyhow, we don't know much about it, but this is apparently a fungus. If you cut through it, it, it looks like a fungus. And it's about 400 million years ago, okay. About uh, 20 to uh, 100 million years ago, we find mushrooms in amber. Amber, as you know, is a way that preserves fossils very well. Here you have a tiny little mushroom in amber, here you have a little bigger one. And it's got these striations, which are very typical of many mushrooms today. So there were mushrooms quite a while ago, right? How about people? Well, this is a, a sculpture, is a painting, a wall painting from Algeria from about 7,000 years ago. We don't know if these things were mushrooms or not. They certainly look a little bit like them, but would have funny to, to have them all over the body. If these were mushrooms, this is the worst, worst case of athletes for it, right? Anyhow. More uh, closer to our time, if you remember there was a, in, some years ago, uh, people, hikers in the, uh, in the Alps found an ice man, which was, which was mummified. And his name was given the name of Otzi because Otzi is the glacier where he was found. He had a lot of things with him. This on the left is a reconstruction of what he had. And among his things, were in this toolkit were these things which are fungi. What they were there for is not clear. There's a lot of discussion about whether this was medicinal or a talisman or just what. But he, uh, it apparently the birch polypore, which is could be used for staunching blood. Maybe he used it for medicinal purposes. Anyhow, these are fungi. We, we can call them mushrooms if you want to, it doesn't matter. This is not, as I say, we don't use this in a technical sense. Anyhow, these are fungi which grow on the sides of trees. And you can find them in our area. This is not uncommon. So how old in, in terms of our, our civilization, how far back can you find mushrooms? Well, in a fresco in Herculaneum, Herculaneum is a place near Pompeii which got covered with the ashes of the Vesuvius in the eruption of 1 AD. You find a, uh, oh no, later than that. Anyhow, you find a fresco which shows a, uh, some partridges uh, and some mushrooms. These mushrooms are recognizable to, as Lactarius deliciosos. Mushrooms have uh, Latin names, as you can imagine. Uh, Lactarius is the genus name and Deliciosus is the species name. This is a mushroom which is eaten in the Mediterranean to date. And you find something like it, very similar to it around here in San Diego. It's quite good to eat. This is what it looks like. So you can see it's very close to what the artist painted in 1 AD. Uh, the Romans were good at mushrooming, and here you have a collection of mushrooms which uh, you can recognize as a mushroom called a porcini mushroom. The whole collect, why they're lined up so, I don't know, but the mosaicists like to do that. It's from, the, from France, but it's a Roman mosaic. In this uh, continent, we find that uh, mushrooms were used in, for, probably for sacred purposes. Um, the Spaniards, when they arrived here, started a thing called a codex, which is sort of a description in pictures of what they saw here. And so here you have a god, a god uh, touching or doing something with a person, the person is holding something that looks like a mushroom. And if you don't believe it, that's a mushroom, they painted next to it something which really does look like mushrooms. So it's probably uh, the use of mushrooms for probably for food and for divinatory purposes, for sacred purposes, were here since probably here have another one. Let's see. Again, this this god is holding what looks like mushrooms. This goes back to about the first century AD. Uh, there are stone carvings of mushrooms 
in the Maya civilization. These are Mayan mushroom stones. And to this day, they were used for divinatory purposes. Uh, a famous curandera, a shaman, by the name of Maria Sabina is shown here. She would use mushrooms, she would eat the mushrooms, hallucinogenic mushrooms, and go into a trance. And this was useful because she could divine the future. She could tell us what was gonna happen. Uh, this was made popular by a, um, uh, this, this by the way is the most, uh, the most typical mushroom there is. This is the uh, idea, if you ask a kid to paint a mushroom, the chances are they'll paint a red mushroom with white dots. It's called the fly agaric or Amanita muscaria. Again, the genus name is Amanita, the species name is muscaria. So what does it do? Well, it gives you a trip all right, but, the tri but since it's poisonous, the trip is gonna be to the emergency room. And you, you find the church is showing Amanita muscari as the paradigm of a mushroom. There's a fairy sitting on top of one, a gnome here and another Santa Clausy like figure sitting on top of Amanita muscari. Um, this, uh, this shows a guardian angel showing the kids which mushrooms were poisonous. So these are different mushrooms. These look like porcini mushrooms to me. There's one porcini, another porcini, but these are Manita muscaria. And Manita muscaria is not good to eat. So the holy uh, angel uh, warns uh, not to eat poisonous mushrooms. This one, widespread. Let's go on to the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, there's not an awful lot because the Middle Ages were, of course, the Dark Ages. But St. Augustine, of all people, who lived in the fourth century AD, said something very interesting. The robber takes from you what a fever or an adder or a poisonous mushroom can take. He lies the whole power of the rage of men to do what a mushroom can. Men eat poisonous mushrooms and they die. This is the kind of stuff you find from the Middle Ages. It's not very sanguine, not very cheerful. But Albertus Magnus, who was an advocate of peaceful, peaceful coexistence between science and religion in the 13th century, had a work called De Vegetabilibus, where he said, it is called the mushroom of flies because crushed in milk, it kills flies. So going back to Amanita muscaria. Why muscaria, by the way, means of the mushroom. So what's the story? Uh, Albertus Magnus said you crush it in milk and it kills flies. Turns out this was not the case. This is not the case. It does not kill the mushrooms, the flies. But if you have, uh, if you make some of the amanita crushed in milk, it will attract flies. And because it's hallucinogenic, the flies get woozy. And now they can be swapped. You can, you can, uh, you can kill them because you can catch them. That's, that's what happens. But Amanita is called Amanita muscaria of the fly in practically every language. Uh, in the Middle Ages, in the year 1050, the Byzantine Empress Zoe Porfiro Genita, which means born to the cloth, to the purple cloth, died of a fever at the age of 72. And the Emperor Constantine insisted that the growth of a mushroom on her grave was a miracle, showing that the soul was numbered among the angels. So mushrooms were not all bad. Here's a cartoon that shows you what mushrooms can do. Uh, this is contemporary, of course. Somebody left? Okay. 
famous among the pictures in the Middle Ages is a fresco from an abbey in France, Plain It's from 1291. So what is this? This looks like a collection of mushrooms, but coming out of a single stem like that, which is very strange. This is Adam and this is Eve, by the way. So what are they? So uh, people, a lot of people think these are mushrooms. Uh, notice that the cap trifurcates, which is very really strange. It is not what you normally think of as a mushroom, but people think it is. Now, uh, I have to call your attention to the fact that uh, mushrooms appear in works of art. And a bunch of us have put together a registry of mushrooms in works of art. And you can find it by Googling registering mushrooms and get you there. There are about 40, 1,500 entries, mainly from the Western world. The reason I make that point is because there are a lot of mushrooms in, illustra in illustrations from the, from the East, from Japan and China. However, we did not include those in our registry because we don't know anything about them. And since we don't, cannot read Japanese or Chinese, it's not fair to put them in because we don't know what to do. Whereas the rest of the, the Western mushrooms that we have in the registry are annotated, we say something about it, and you can find out what it is. So this is the kind of stuff we have. From the middle, late Middle Ages, 16, nearly 14, the year 1400, uh, there is a tapestry which shows a horseman. Uh, this is the black horse and the famine. This is the famine, I guess. This is the black horse, which is not shown, but here are mushrooms. Well, let me say that when we started out, we thought we would learn a lot about the meaning of mushrooms in works of art. I must say we're disappointed. There's very little symbolic that shows up when you look at mushrooms in works of art. They're there. They seem to be there along with flowers and plants. There's not much to say about them. However, we'll try. And here is a, from a book, a, a man gathering truffles. Well, the truffles he's gathering are almost the size of a head of a human being. No truffle is that big. And they grow on ledges, which is not the way you find uh, mushrooms. So not everything that you find from the 14th century or thereabouts is accurate. But you find a Madonna holding a mushroom. You can't see it very well, but she's holding a mushroom here in a church in Spain. And there's a whole collection of Madonnas with child which show mushrooms. In the Renaissance, we find a birth of interest in science and of course in mushrooms. And this is the first book, first illustration in the book from 1491. It's called Ortus Sanitatis, the, the Garden of Health. And this shows a bunch of mushrooms. There's no question that the mushrooms, which ones they are, I must say, I'm hard to tell. I'm hard put to tell. It's very difficult to really make out what they are. But this is the man who started scientific mycology, a Dutchman, my name is Adrian de, de Jong, from the world. Yeah. Uh, he, he was, uh, blah, 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 blah. never mind that. He's from the, 15th, from the 16th century. And he wrote a book, the first book written on mushrooms, called Folly. The part of my translation is Folly, a description of pictures of life of the fungi growing, occasionally signs of Holland by Adrianus Junius. His name is De Jong, but Latinized, the camera came out as Adrianus Junius. Anyhow, what is this about? Well, there are fungi which look like penises. And here it is. It's called Hadriani after Hadrianus. And it looks like a phallus. So what's this all about? Well, a mushroom is a, a, way, a way of spores making more spores. Mushrooms make spores in large amounts. And this is one way to disperse them. Uh, this gray mass on top of the mushroom is a collection of spores and they're wet so they don't spread through the air like, 
I'll, I'll sort of come to that in a minute. These are very smelly. They smell to like carriers. You can mistake being in the presence of the of one of these mushrooms with, 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 with ten feet. And so this attracts flies. The flies land on this. They eat some of it, and they get this this is sticky stuff. They get it on their legs, so they fly away. And when they land, the spores are are spread to the new site. This is a picture from the book of uh, Hadrian. Uh, it's very telling. In the uh, somewhere in around 1500, we find a picture of the three ages of women, young, middle, and old. And here is a tree with fungi growing on it. So we begin to see illustrations of mushrooms like that. And this is a very good one. This is a picture of Bruegel. There are several Bruegels. This is Peter the Elder. And it's called Visit to a Farmhouse. And it's around the middle, of, let's say, the middle of the 16th century. And here's a cauldron over the fire. And there are mushrooms in it. Uh, the way people ate, by the way, in the Middle Ages uh, was not to sit down at dinner or lunch or breakfast, but simply to have a cauldron with food cooking all day long. And whenever you were hungry, you just went to it and helped yourself. But here is unmistakably the use of mushrooms in the 16th century. In the Baroque time, we see a lot. In the north, there's an unknown Italian painter who goes by the name of Sudo Fabella. There was a painter called, Su called Fabella, and this guy is called Sudo Fabella because nobody knows who he was. But this is a still life showing mushrooms. These are porcini mushrooms, undoubtedly. Well, this may not be. This is, uh, is Caesar's mushroom. But these are porcini because you can see, maybe you can make it out. Instead of having gills, partitions, lamellae, they have pores. And here's asparagus and some cherries and some prunes and apples and who knows what else. This is typical of middle of uh, Baroque, the Baroque period. And there are hundreds of these, a lot of them. And there's also a guy, a Dutchman, by the name of Otto Marcius van Schrich. And Marcius painted scenes in the woods, in the understory. This is in Italian, it's called the Sotobosco style, pictures of the under. And they're kind of macabre, they look, they look very tenable. Here are moths, butterflies, snail, and mushrooms. And he did a lot of this. Marcellus, uh, although he was a Dutchman, he went to Italy. There were a lot of people from Northern Europe went to Italy in the uh, 17th century. And we became part of a school of naturalist painters and he started his paintings and done all over in many museums. Here's another one by him. You can see this mushroom here, which looks like Caesar's mushroom. This is a bolete that is a, a, the porcini, in the family, the porcini mushrooms. And here is something called a, uh, coral mushroom. You have a snake, a toad, moths, and so on. Now, he never saw all this, and a flower of some sort, there's another snake. He never saw all this in reality under, under the trees. He made, he must have made sketches of these things, taking him to his study and painting him there. So he was a, he went to depict nature in its raw form. Uh, there was some funny stuff too. There's a guy in the name of Archimboldo, an Italian from the late 16th century. And he painted figures made up of apples, and, uh, uh, chestnut, and gourd. And for an ear, he had a mushroom. I don't know what that is, a pear, an apple, stuff like that. He had a good time. He did, uh, he painted different times of the year, and this was autumn. Mushroom vendors are particularly interesting to some of us because they show 
what it is that people ate. So here you have a picture by a, a Flemish, a Flemish painter, uh, Franz Snyders, Snyders uh, fruits and vegetables then. And you have big gourds here, a huge cabbage, cauliflower, a gigantic one. Things are a little bit of size. And here are mushrooms. They look like field mushrooms, uh, cousins of the button mushroom you buy in the store. So here you have it. The mushrooms were sold in Flanders in the 16th century. And here's another one, also like from Flanders, Norbert van Bromen called Cephalus. Why they call Cephalus, I don't know. It's a vegetable vendor in a southern landscape with a caprice. A caprice is a sort of an inventive fantasy of Rome in the background. And here you have, uh, again, these gigantic cauliflowers, cabbages, uh, cucumbers, and mushrooms right on the, on the ground. So they, they were popular. And here is one of my favorite. This is an Italian, Felice Boselli, a little bit later, called the Mushroom Cellar. And you have uh, Caesar's mushrooms here and probably some porcini mushrooms. In a very sort of a moving pose, she's carrying these from one place to another. And she got caught in the act. <coughs> I think this is a very lovely painting. Uh, mushroom vendors, uh, there's uh, it tells you here from the Italian Baroque, uh, there were a lot of field champignons, probably porcini, Caesar's mushroom, chanterelles, which some of you may know, and so forth. And the Flemish Baroque are a little bit different. Anyhow, we have some statistics in there. This is maybe the first painting of a cultivated mushroom, the white button mushroom. Uh, from uh, probably around the beginning of the 18th century. This, uh, this the mushroom that we know, uh, uh, find in the stores, the button mushroom, was cultivated first in France around the 17th century. So this may be the first painting of a cultivated mushroom. You can see that it's sold along with others and it looks a lot like maybe more a cremini than a white button mushroom. By the way, cremini and the white button mushroom are the same species. And guess what? So are portobello mushrooms. Even though they're quite big, they're the same as the button mushroom only is grown, but they didn't grow out. The button mushroom is cultivated when it's young. It's a baby. If you let it grow, you end up with a cremini. If you go further, you end up with a portobello. In later times, we find something very unusual. Victor Hugo, who been associated with, with writing, was also a painter, and he painted a gigantic champignon, called it champignon. Champignon in French means mushroom. So uh, he painted a gigantic thing with a city in the background. This is really weird, and it looks like a uh, a bolete. It looks like a uh, porcini kind of mushroom. Uh, the Hungarians and the Russians painted people collecting mushrooms. So you find a basket. Sorry. Kids were sent out to collect mushrooms. They were told by the grandmother how to pick edible mushrooms. And you have a couple of baskets. The, mushroom collectors. the English were supposed to be non-mushroom lovers. But uh, here's a picture by Gainsborough, famous British painter, called The Haymaker and the Sleeping Girl. And he has a basket, and you can oh, she has a basket here. Can't make it out too well, but oh, here. In this basket, she has mushrooms. So it's not true that the British didn't pick mushrooms. They did, they just didn't make a point of it. They didn't brag about it, I guess. 
There also is a genre called the Victorian fairy paintings in the 19th century, where uh, people painted fairies. They look like uh, Barbie dolls running about this dog. And here you have the uh, fairies making a fairy ring, which is a mushroom motif, by the way, rather dancing around toadstools. And then we have the toadstools. Here's one which is dying, and they are dying. Interesting. There's a whole collection of uh, fairy paintings, and many have mushrooms in them. Here's another one by Dad showing Puck sitting on a mushroom. And this is the end of my mushrooms in our story. Thank you.